a broke nose fighter I'm a loose lip liar Searching for the edge of darkness But all I get is just tired I went looking for attention In all the wrong places I was needing a redemption And all I got was just caging If I'm being real honest, I'm fighting up your battles. I can't seem to find the right light, cause I've been living in the shadows. I went looking for attention in all the wrong places. I was seeking recognition, but all I got was just cages. Oh, 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 Looking back on all the wreckage all I see is their faces How many hearts have I broken? And tell me all they're still breaking I went looking for attention In all the wrong places I was needing a redemption Get me out of these cages Oh I had a bright white cheek. Oh, 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 it was pulling on me. Oh, 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 till I was almost dead. Oh, oh, oh you in these cages. There's a window in the cage I'm in I can see what kind of man I've been I'm in a prison for a man gone wrong But I found a future that is not my home We're a band of outsiders Spent a whole life chasing, trying to climb a little higher, but the higher just faded. We went looking for attention in all the wrong places. We were needing a redemption, and all we got was just cages. just part of our story, that at some point in our lives, we walked around and we were, we were all looking for attention, right? We were looking for attention in the wrong places. Or perhaps, in, and perhaps you didn't use this word, but you were looking for redemption. That you were looking for some form of redemption somewhere around. And, and, and all you've got, and perhaps all you've got left, all you've got as you sit here today, all you've got is just cages. And I, I'm certainly glad that you're here. I don't know how you might feel or, or if you resonate with that. Um, but I certainly think that there are a whole bunch of people who feel like that in this life. I also think that there were a whole bunch of people who felt like this when Jesus was around. In fact, Jesus came and he said, come to me, those who are weary and beat down, and I will give you rest. And often we, we leave out the next part, or some people don't even mention that first part, because it's the first part really that makes the second part of what Jesus said there. He says that if you hold to my teaching you'll find truth, and the truth will in fact set you free. And it'll set you free from your cages, whatever you have around you. That's why when we talk around here, we talk a lot about this idea that following Jesus will not only make your life better, but it's gonna make you better at life as well. 
Now, we're in this uh, part three of the series called Guardrails. And just to kind of catch some of you up, we all know what a guardrail is. We see a guardrail. Maybe you were driving yesterday. Maybe you were driving here this morning. You saw a guardrail somewhere along the way. But a guardrail is essentially this. It's a system designed to keep vehicles from straying into dangerous or off-limit areas. That there are these things on the side of the road that help keep us in from moving off into these dangerous areas on each side. And we said from the beginning that guardrails essentially uh, exist for two things, two reasons. They ex- exist to direct and protect us, to direct and to protect us. In fact, one of the things that we recognize about guardrails, and it's very specific in line with what we're talking about in, in, you know, in a lot of our conversation, is that a guardrail, a guardrail is always inside the safety zone. It's never in the danger zone. There's always a little bit of margin. And no one argues with that. No one argues when you're driving around a curve or you're driving around you know, a bridge. No one argues that, hey, I think that that guardrail should in fact be on the danger zone side. No one argues that there's a little bit of margin, that it's in fact inside the safety zone. The other thing about guardrails is that guardrails are designed to minimize damage. That if you hit that guardrail, there's going to be minimal damage to your car. You might walk away from that accident fine. But had that guardrail not been there, you may not have walked away from that accident. And you may have experienced a lot more damage to your body as well as your car. But as we said from the beginning of the series, that the highway is not the only place that we, in fact, need guardrails. That, in fact, your greatest regret, my greatest regret, probably came, it could have been avoided, it should have been avoided, if we'd had some moral guardrails in place. Maybe some financial guardrails in place. Maybe some relational guardrails in place. Perhaps even some professional guardrails in place. Now, guardrails isn't kind of like a law. It's not this thing that you have to abide by. Essentially, guardrail is a personal rule. Guardrail is a personal rule for you and for me that uh, we establish for ourselves. I'm not establishing this guardrail for you. It's a personal rule for me and uh, that I'm existing in my life. And it's essentially this. It's a standard of behavior that becomes a matter of conscience. That it's a standard of behavior. It's a personal standard of behavior that I have for me, that I've set up for my life, that sits inside there. And the moment something happens, it dings my conscience. It kind of triggers something inside of me. It makes me a little uneasy. In fact, a guardrail is there really to make us feel uneasy early. That before we get into the danger zone, we hit up against this guardrail and we like minimal damage, something's going off in my mind, I'm feeling a little uneasy, I need to pay attention to what is going on here. But the interesting thing is we live in a culture where culture doesn't exactly encourage guardrails, right? Culture certainly doesn't uh, want to celebrate the guardrails that you have in your life, the personal rules that you have in your life. In fact, it's very content with just having painted lines, just like some parts of the road. There's just these painted lines along there, and and culture's certainly just perfectly fine with having those things running around in life. But one of the things that is interesting and that I specifically find interesting about uh, the idea of guardrails is the topic we're going to be talking about today is very, very sort of against culture. It's something that when culture sees what we're talking about today, they kind of stiff arm it. Now, last week we spoke about guardrails in light of our friends and associates. Today we're talking about guardrails in light of our friends with benefits, okay? That's what we're talking about today. Thank you. We got one, one giggle at that. <clears throat> friends with benefits, that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about the idea of moral guardrails. And so we're gonna, we've got some guardrails in our lives that we need to set up. And specifically I want to talk about guarding your marriage. I want to talk about specifically maybe guarding yourself for marriage. And perhaps guarding yourself from other married people, Okay? There are a whole bunch of things that we can guard ourselves when it comes to moral guardrails, and we want to be able to talk about it. The best way to describe this is maybe one word that we do not use very often is this word, fidelity. We do not use that word a lot. It comes from the Latin, uh, Latin word that says faithful or loyal. It's a small little word. We don't use it that often, but it's the best way to describe the idea that we're talking about today. And what's interesting about this idea is uh, that nowhere in culture, nowhere do we experience this in culture other than this specific topic, that the culture begins to bait us into this, and then it begins to shame us when we cross a line, right? When it comes to our moral guidelines, it's baiting us the entire time, but then it's so quick to be able to shame us. But what's interesting about this is that we're all complicit to this tension. We all experience this tension. Except we, we, we entertain ourselves with things on Netflix and, and movies. We sing about these things. We sing about these songs. Uh, we, we maybe even watch soap operas where this is just everywhere. We entertain, we entertain ourselves with stories of affairs. But when one of our friends actually has one, we're disgusted. In fact, 
Maybe you've done this. You're driving to go and tell your friend how disgusted you are with their husband or their wife, and you can't believe that that person's having an affair. And you're singing along to a song that is singing about someone having an affair. We entertain ourselves with this. On one hand, we're completely against this, but we're drawn into, we dip into a culture every single day that is encouraging this. That's why I say, we, nowhere else in culture does culture do such a good job of baiting us and then at the same time shaming us for what is going on. In fact, uh, you've, you've heard the term boys will be boys, right? Boys will be boys. Ah, don't worry about it, boys will be boys. Anne Foskamp says this amazing thing, and I think it's pretty incredible. Boys will be boys, girls will be garbage. Not because of what her final thing is. But it's because as a culture, we are so against girls being mistreated, right? We will stand up for anything when women are mistreated. But we just pass it off and go, boys will be boys. It's fine, boys will be boys. When in actual fact, that is the truth of what happens. And I understand that that's heavy. But I'm trying to explain to you that the nowhere in culture do we get baited. And the moment we cross a line, culture begins to shame us as well. And if we could just get this one thing right, if we could just get this one idea right, and I know this is kind of utopian in thinking, but if we get this one idea right, our communities would be better, our cities would be better, our nation would be better because there'd be a whole bunch less poverty. There'd be a whole bunch of, a whole fewer unwanted pregnancies. There'd be a whole bunch less domestic violence There'd be so many fewer kids in the foster care system. There'd be a whole bunch of kids who never got raised without a mom or a dad. If we just get this one thing right. In fact, maybe for you, or maybe you know someone, or you know someone who was raised by someone, where if this was true in their life, their life would be completely different. And what's amazing to me is over 2,000 years ago, the Apostle Paul was moving around the Mediterranean and he's planting a whole bunch of churches. In fact, he'd, he'd gone there and he'd visited these churches and then he would write letters to these churches. And one of the ones we're gonna look at today was a letter he wrote to the church of Corinth. And he, he kind of has a look at their culture of what they're living in with all the, kind of the idol worship that's going on and, and the temple prostitutes that are happening and sort of the bribery and, and corruption that's happening on the one side. And uh, they, they were, their culture was just this, this whole immoral thing. And anything you can kind of think of immoral, no matter what your standards are, they were involved in that. And that to their culture was just normal. But to us, in our culture nowadays, it seems very immoral. And, and here Paul is, and he's writing back to these people. He's writing back to the church of Corinth with all that in mind. And he says this right up front. He says, flee from sexual immorality. Flee from sexual immorality. Stay away from those things. And now before you like, Right, I'm going to get up and walk out. He's talking about that topic, right? I don't want to listen to that at all. I just want to put it in context for you. If, if, the, if there really is a God, if there truly is, if, if there is a God out there, and the best way to describe that God to you and to me, the, the best description of God for us to understand is that he is a perfect heavenly father. What would you expect that God, who's invited you to call him father, to say to you about, about this topic? What would you expect him to say? What, what, would you, what would you expect him to kind of list out for you to do about this topic? And you and I both know this, that this is exactly what we want, what every husband wants their wife to do, what every wife wants their husband to do, what every fiance wants their fiance to do, right? What every big brother wants their sister to do. It's what you want for the people who love you love but we, in, we live in a culture where this is true, that we tend to flirt with and we don't flee from. We can, it's like, how close can I get to this line? Like, how far is far enough? We're like, how far is too far? I, I just wanna try and get as close to that line as I can. We flirt with instead of fleeing from, yet we live in a culture that baits us and then it's willing to shame us when we step over that line. Paul carries on, and what's amazing about what he's about to say is that it's, not the fact that, you know, it's 2,000 years ago, but what, what he's saying is the fact that 2,000 years ago, he knew this was gonna happen. He says that all other sins, he kind of takes sexual sin and he puts it all by itself. He says that, that all other sins, this sexual sin that we're talking about, it is uniquely damaging. It's possible for you to c recover financially. If you go broke, you can recover financially. If you fail at university, you can recover academically. This one, no. Forgiven 
absolutely. But fully escape the consequences, never. And some of you know this because this can cause generational damage, right? Some of you who are older along, you understand that it undermines the intimacy that you can have in the future with other people. And what's amazing about sexual sin as well is it continues to resurface years and years and years after the fact. Sexual sin, another amazing thing about sexual sin is it can make you a liar and it can make you a secret keeper for life. It can make you a liar and a secret keeper for life. And why would you want to keep a secret from the person that you love the most? In fact, some of the most tragic stories I've heard about relationships that have just you know, gone south, they've ended up in divorce or they've kind of parted ways and it's just never been the same again is when someone stood at the altar and they said, I love you, I'm going to love you forever and ever and ever but I've got a secret that I'm keeping and I'm not gonna let you know that secret because of what you might think of me. And then years later, that secret comes out and there's all this damage that is caused because they were being a secret keeper. Sexual sin can make you be a secret keeper and a liar for life. And Paul says, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. And I, I wanna just unpack that phrase a little bit for you, that uh, phrase of sexual sin. Now, I, you know, I don't know, we all have different backgrounds. We all grew up in church. We, you know, maybe you attended church, maybe you, you know, first time back here. Maybe this is the topic that made you leave church. You were like, that preacher's talking about that again. I'm just going to get up and leave. Like, I don't want to hear about this. Uh, maybe you, you kind of think about when it comes to sex, you kind of think that God's like, God's completely against it. That God, in fact, you know, that, that God has a very low tolerance for whatever is going on with that regard. But here's what Christians believe. Christians believe that God, in fact, created sex. Matter of fact, I don't, I don't know how this happened, but God was maybe like, hey, Jesus, I've got this great idea. And the angels are like, oh, what? It's like, you're not gonna understand, but you're just gonna have to watch. It's like, let's just, I don't know how this happened, okay? But we certainly believe that God created sex, that at some point in our lives, there was never anything like sex, and that God created it. And it wasn't only for procreation. It was this wonderful, it was this, damaging, it was a powerful, it, 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 it could cause all kinds of things. And yet God gave it to us with some guidelines. And he said, if you abide by those guidelines, if you stick to those guidelines, this is going to be everything you want it to be. But if you break those guidelines, you break my heart because I love you. And I'm giving this because I love you. Now, in the New Testament, uh, the you know, Jesus, Jesus had a whole bunch of followers and Jesus was roaming the earth and the New Testament is written by these people who spent time with Jesus or, um, you know, were able to document a whole bunch of things as the church was starting off and that's the New Testament. And one of the guys who spent time with Jesus, uh, well, who had spent time with the followers of Jesus was able to write this letter and he, his name was Paul. And the, the theme of sin that comes out of the New Testament, the, the kind of, if you were gonna contextualize sin in that, is anytime you hurt someone, someone anytime you steal from someone, or anytime you uh, dishonor someone, sometimes defraud someone as well. If you do, if you hurt someone, if you steal from someone, if you dishonor someone, if you defraud someone, that is essentially sin. That if I'm gonna put me before you to your detriment, that is in fact a sin. If you're gonna put me, if you're gonna put yourself before me and it's to my detriment, that is in fact a sin. And maybe you've heard of the golden rule. The golden rule is do unto others as you would have them do unto you, right? Well, Jesus came along and he called everyone to the platinum rule. And that was do unto others as God through Christ has done unto you. And so if you do something to someone else that God wouldn't do to that person because of what he has done through Christ to you, then that would be considered a sin. That's just written to Christians. So if you're not a Christian, uh, you can live by the golden rule. That's, that's a thing. But if, you, if you're gonna step over those lines, then you know, God loves you so much. God loves every single person. The person to your left, the person to your right. God loves them enough that he'd want them to have the life that he came to give through Jesus, which was life to the full. And that's why he says what he says. What else would you expect the heavenly father who's invited you to call him father to say to you about this topic? The, other, the best way to describe this is actually to speak to you like a father would. That if you come along and you do something bad to my children, if you hurt one of my children, like we've got a problem, Okay. You, you, can, you can give me as much money as you want. You can say as many things as you want. You can stand on a soapbox and you can shout all my praises. But we're always gonna have a problem because you've done something to the one that I love. 
and because of that, you've, in, you've ended up hurting me. And so if we, if we take this extraordinary thing that God has created, this extraordinary gift that was designed for an exclusive one, one person covenant between two people. If, if we take that and, and we take that with another person, we kind of divvy it up amongst a whole bunch of people. We're not only hurting that person, we're hurting the other people as well. That when, when you take something from someone or take something that was designed to be given to someone else, that is a sin. So Paul carries on here and he says, flee from sexual immorality. Uh, all, go back one. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside of the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Sins against their own body. And he says it's going to hurt you as well. It's going to, in fact, hurt what is going on inside of you. Let's go to the next one. And he says, he says to these people, do you not know? Like maybe you've forgotten. Do you not know this is what we talked about? This is what I talked about when I was with you? Do you not remember? To which I think he might have thought, hey, maybe those people weren't there. Maybe they weren't there when I was with them. Maybe I should expand this a little bit. Maybe I should write this down a little bit more. If, and hey, th maybe there's something that you do not know that if you knew it would impact your behavior. And remember, this isn't about consequence avoidance, that there is this grander reason why God wants us to avoid these things. And he says that your bodies are, do, not, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? And what's amazing about what Paul's doing is Paul shifts this conversation from consequence, because we always look at this as a consequence, right? What's going to happen at the end? And sometimes it is really just about avoiding those big consequences. It's about consequence avoidance. He's, he's moving away from that, and he's talking about identity. Do you not know who you are? Do you know, not know who, what you are? Do you not know? He says, you're a temple. And for many of us, specifically if you think about a temple, the only time we've visited a temple, for most of us, is the fact that it was a tourist attraction, right? We're visiting a place and there's a temple and we walked into the temple and we went and experienced that temple. It's a tourist attraction. That nowadays, temples aren't even sacred anymore. In fact, in our culture, I would argue that not many things are sacred anymore. Paul says, no, 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 no. Out of all the places that people consider sacred around the entire earth, you are a temple. You are, in fact, sacred. You're, in fact, a sacred image bearer. You bear the image of God, and you were designed, you were fine-tuned for intimacy with one other person. You're no mere mammal that's going to go, you know, just out there like we do see with animals. Neither is the person beside you. that the Spirit of God resides in you. And Paul would say that you are a temple. You are sacred. And what's amazing, we all know this, that the value of a container is determined by what it contains. And you have the Spirit of God living inside of you. In fact, if you stole my wallet, if someone stole my wallet and they gave me all the contents back, I'd be like, you take the wallet. It's an amazing story, right? Hey, I'm gonna steal your wallet. I want everything, I just want your wallet. You can take everything inside. You can tell all your friends about that. Because it's not the wallet. I don't care about the wallet. I care about what's inside the wallet. The value of a container is determined by what it contains. I was going to use a lady's handbag, but like, you know, what's more valuable, the handbag or what's the contents? But that can go either way, right? I, I'd, I'd stick with the wallet for that one. But the value, the value of a container is, the, is what's inside. And you have the Spirit of God. You're a sacred image bearer. You bear the image of God. In fact, Paul says this, he says, you are not your own. You are not your own, which you might say, yes, I am, I'm an adult. I, I'm, I'm, I've got, you know, I'm a free person. I have free will, I can do whatever I want. It's my body, I can do with it what I want. And Paul would say, no, you're not. No, because the other thing that we need to be realize is that we need to be glad that we are not. Because the other thing is that value is often determined by ownership. That value is, in fact, determined by ownership. In fact, uh, a couple of years ago, if you're a musician, you might freak out about this. I, I find this quite interesting. In 2016, there was a two-year-old guitar. It was uh, made in 2014. It was a Fender Stratocaster. Um, it was made, it's worth about 25,000 rand. And so when it was sold, it was sold for about 25,000 rand. And uh, two years later, okay, a guitar that was worth 25,000 rand sold for over 600,000 rand. 
which is amazing, it's mind blowing. But why would someone pay 600,000 Rand for something that was worth 25,000 Rand just two years prior? It was because who owned that item? That ownership sometimes determines the value. In fact, that guitar had that person's signature on it, and it was Eric Clapton. And the moment Eric Clapton said, that's my guitar, the value of that thing skyrocketed. Went from 25,000 to 600,000. That the value of something is sometimes determined by the ownership as well, and so be glad that you're not your own, because you are, and God calls you a child of his. You are a child of God. And because you have a child of God, you have remarkable value. You have extraordinary value. And so does the person to your left. So does the person to your right. So does the person that you love. So does the person that you're thinking about getting involved in. So does every single person on this planet. Paul carries on and says, you were bought with a price. You were bought with a price. And, and we can put a price to anything, right? You can put a price tag on anything. But the value of something is often determined by what it will bring. That guitar could have just been worth 25,000 25, rand. Could have just been like that. But that person decided that was more valuable. And it brought in 600,000 rand. A pri- the value of a thing is often determined by the price that it will bring. You are valuable to God. In fact, the price that he paid, the price that he bought reconciliation with you was his son. He paid the life of his son to have a reconciled relationship with you. Paul kind of wants to bring this whole thing together and he says, therefore, therefore, in light of all the selfishness that is sexual sin, in light of your extraordinary value that you have and that you are fine-tuned for intimacy with one individual person. And here's the application. He says, therefore, honor God with your bodies. This is the New Testament sexual ethic. Honor God with your bodies and honor other bodies with your body. Honor God with your body and honor other bodies with your body as well. You need to be able to honor those people around you. And it has nothing to do with, you know, staying out of trouble. It has nothing to do with, you know, seeing how far you can go. It has everything to do with the value of who you are, what you are, and the value of the people that you love and that you're thinking about getting involved in as well. And as we said right at the beginning, what's interesting about this is you, you're never going to be applauded for taking on these guardrails, right? You, you're not going to, you know, people aren't going to stand about and go, <laughs> well done, you know, you took that guardrail on. In fact, again, culture is baiting us into this so that they, ultimately culture can go ahead and shame us. But this is what we all know, is that fleeing requires guardrails. We can flirt with all we want. Fleeing is going to require guardrails. Now, for the next couple of minutes, all I really want to do is I want to put some suggestions out there. And uh, <clears throat> sorry, some of them you're going to like, some of them you're not going to like. And uh, in fact, if you listen to the next couple of minutes and you just like, I'm disregarding, Morgan, you should never, whatever your name is, just, I don't even know what you said. Like, I'm just going to disregard that altogether. I'm, I'm okay with that. If you don't want to take any of these suggestions under, that's fine. But what I do want to ask you is this. Would you at least establish some of your own guardrails when it comes to moral ethics when it comes to moral guardrails. Will you at least, if you don't have to take my suggestions, would you at least consider establishing some moral guardrails for yourself? The first thing, first suggestion is <clears throat> when it comes to relational guardrails is to talk about it. Is to talk about it. Have a conversation about it. If you're here today and you're married, uh, you're engaged, maybe you're still dating, uh, you know, dating potentially the person that you're going to marry one day, one of the things I want to ask you to do is I want you to talk together. I want you to have a conversation, talk about it. I would love for you to decide together, ahead of time, decide together what would be appropriate behavior. Maybe ask, ask this question, what would be appropriate behavior for me when it comes to a relationship at work, when it comes to a relationship you know, with our friends, with specific friends? What, what would be appropriate behavior for me? And let me tell you what appropriate behavior for you would be. What behavior is going to be off limits for me? And what behavior is going to be off limits for you? Decide together about what that might be. One of my suggestions is certainly avoid traveling with. uh, I know this is a bit controversial, especially after week one and the conversations that have ensued because of that. If you want to go back and listen, you can. It's all on our website. But uh, if I would highly encourage you to avoid traveling with or eating alone with problematic people. 
To which you might say, well, who are problematic people? To which I would say, you already know. You're smart people. You already know who the problematic people are in your life. The fact that, you know, you get to work and you could go left or you could go right to your, your, your desk, but you, you, know, you know that person is on the left and so you're gonna choose the left every single time, right? You move in that direction. Or perhaps you, you kind of just feel yourself like, you know, you hear someone coming towards your desk or you, you hear someone coming to your office and you kind of straighten up and you, you know, make sure you catch a glimpse in the mirror quickly and fix your hair. When that happens, you know who a problematic person, potentially problematic person is. And they could be doing nothing. It could be 100% you. They could know nothing about this or about your feelings for them. But I would avoid spending time with problem, potentially problematic people. Now, in week one, I spoke about the Billy Graham rule. And Billy Graham was a man who in the 60s decided that he was never going to eat with, travel with, um, or spend time alone with uh, people who weren't, uh, women who weren't his family members, his wife or his family members. He, he decided that. And many men and many women have adopted that same thing. And uh, it is very controversial. He's taken a lot of criticism. He took a lot of criticism for that over the years. And I recognize specifically that, it, I mean, even in my life, I've had that rule since, from, since before I was married, that that was something that I was going to put in place in my life. And one of the things that, that I recognize is that, you, you know, depending on who you work with, you do not have control over that. You do not con have control over the relationships you have at work. You do not have control over the situations you get put in because of work. And, you know, if you're going to step back from those things, something detrimental might happen to your career. I understand that. But should you have to violate that law? Should you have to violate your guardrail? Remember, it's not a law. It's a guardrail. It's something, you know, it's a personal guideline that you've put in place for your life. Should you have to violate it, I would encourage you to tell them about it. Tell the person that you love the most about it. Tell, tell the person. I, I, I've stepped over, you know, gone past my personal boundary sometimes, and I've phoned Kelly, and I'm like, Kelly, this is what happened. This is the situation. This is kind of what had to happen. And, you know, the air's clear. We all know what's going on, and forward we go. But if you have to violate something that's going on, I would encourage you to go and tell those people about it. When you find yourself hesitating to tell the other person, when there's something in you and you're like, I'm just not gonna tell them this time, when there's something that is hesitant about you, about whatever situation it is in, that you're hesitating to tell the other person, that should set an alarm off in your heart and in your mind, that there is something going on there that you need to pay attention to. You should at least be honest with yourself and you need to be honest with your spouse, with the person that you think is the most important person in your life. The other thing I would say is uh, don't get into a counseling relationship with someone who is a problematic person. Don't get into a counseling relationship. They may need you, but they don't need to fall in love with you. They don't need to get into uh, a situation where you know, there's possible intimacy, that there's possible attraction. They may need you and you can help them get help. Besides, many of you are not counselors. In fact, many of you would say, just like me, you don't give good advice. So don't get into a, a counseling relationship with a potentially problematic person where there can suddenly start some attraction between you and that person as well. The last one I would say this is that um, when you kind of feel yourself, and, and this is a little tricky to, to try and explain, but uh, when you feel your heart, perhaps your desire drifting in a certain direction, like you get up in the morning and you're dressing for a specific person, when, when you're suddenly, you know, you're doing things to uh, get the attention of or get perhaps the praise of someone, then I, I, I think that you need to at least, and I, I would certainly recommend this, I would recommend that you tell somebody. Because I certainly know this, that speaking about it often diffuses the situation. That speaking about it often diffuses the situation. And if there is something in you that is being drifted towards a person, away from the person that you would say is the most important person in the world to you, you need to pay attention to that. And speaking about it to someone often diffuses you. You should at least be honest with yourself and honest with your spouse about what is in fact going on. Now, one of the big objections to kind of these suggestions and, and this whole idea of moral guardrails as well is that doesn't some of this kind of diminish women's professional opportunities? And when it's misapplied, it certainly can. If it's misapplied, it definitely can limit 
what's going on. I mean, I, I, I read a story about this woman. She, she left a for-profit company. She was doing, doing so well in, in a for-profit company. She moved to a non-profit company, and every single man in that organization had the Billy Graham rule. And so she was never invited for coffee. She was never allowed to attend a meeting when there were just men around. She was never invited on business trips. She was completely sidelined. No guardrail should ever get in the way of someone climbing a professional ladder or, or a corporate ladder. No, no moral guardrails should step in the way of that. And certainly, if it's misapplied, it can definitely cause some problems. But every single one of us who are in positions of power need to be aware and make sure that they don't. We should never, never kind of, you know, let a woman not climb a corporate ladder because of her skill set or because of moral guardrails. If she's got the right skill set, if she's got the right abilities, if she's got the right temperament, we should never, and, and if we're in charge, we should be looking out to make sure that guardrails are not getting in the way. The other objection to many of this is that uh, it makes it sound like women are predators, right? That women are just trying to get out there. They want to just, you know, cut everyone down, and they want to just, you know, go ahead. I just want to be really clear about this. Men are predators, okay? As we looked at in week one, men are predators. We are cavemen. We're slightly evolved cavemen, right? And, and what's actually happening here is sometimes you look at this and you kind of see these guardrails in place, especially in, in a corporate environment, and many people look at it and they say, well, we're just trying to diminish women's abilities in the, in the corporate place. But these things are in fact there to protect women. That they're actually there to protect women because men at the end of the day are the predators. I, I, I look at the news stories and I mostly see a whole bunch of stories, and normally they're happening all the time. I see a whole bunch of stories about men losing their jobs, or, or having, you know, they're being sued because of some sexual harassment case or some sexual conversation. I, I don't know, maybe it has happened, but I've never seen a woman who has lost her job because she was sexually harassing men. I have never seen that. It may have happened. I don't know about that. It is normally the men who are the part, for the most part, of the problem. So this, this guardrail that we put in place, when misapplied, yes, it can be detrimental to a woman's career. But it's actually there to protect women. The other, the other area you need to pay attention to specifically, and, and this is very prevalent amongst teens, is social media. And if you did not know this, say, social media is a gateway drug. Social media is a gateway drug because you idealize, you fantasize, and then you romanticize. You idealize because all you're doing is you're seeing that person's highlight reel, right? They're just posting their best photos. No one's like posting you know, their worst day on social media. No one does that. If you know someone, I'd love to see that because I, I haven't seen that anywhere. You idealize in your head, and then you start comparing it to your relationship. You begin to fantasize about that person. You fantasize about what's going on, and then you romanticize it. And suddenly, wh when you actually meet this person, it can sometimes be worse than meeting this person in, in, you know, actually in, physical, in a physical environment. When you finally meet this person, or the two of you get together, there's this kind of, you know, the stakes up. Everything's, you know, gone up to this level. And it can be very detrimental to your environment. Social media can be a gateway drug for a whole bunch of things we do not want to get involved in. Now, we've been talking about this. I would love for you to talk together, talk about it, tell them about it, and tell someone. And decide beforehand, right up front, what your guardrails are going to be. Because the point of a guardrail is this. The point of a guardrail is to light up our conscience before we veer into the danger zone. Before we get there. Not once we're over the edge and we're experiencing loss or whatever that might be. Before we even get there. Now, I understand this might sound extreme. Uh, you know, it might sound like <clears throat> it's all over the place and, and a very extreme case on this. Uh, but I, I do know this, that dangerous environments, next slide, dangerous environments call for extreme measures. Dangerous environments call for extreme measures. Maybe you've experienced this in life, but here's some questions that maybe will help you understand this. If, you, if you're married and you're engaged, or you're engaged uh, here's a question for you. What in our culture equips you or supports you in your decision to remain faithful? What in our culture equips you? Where do you feel like you've got wind in your sail? You're like, man, if I spend time in this environment, I am like, it is just equipping me, it is just supporting me to stay faithful in my marriage. Wh where is that? Virtually nowhere, other than perhaps here. Which I would be so bold as to say that anything outside the church is then dangerous to your relationship your decision to remain faithful. Singles, similar question. If you're single here, what 
or who is encouraging you and equipping you to live responsibly when it comes to your sexuality and ultimately your relationships? What's equipping you? Where do you find like, hey, you know, that I'm just going to go spend time in that environment because that is just equipping me. Where, where do you get that? In fact, many of you have experienced a culture where it tells you the exact opposite thing, right? Many of you have experienced the exact opposite. It bakes you in, it bakes you in, it bakes you in, and then you step over the line and it shames you. It just pushes you away. Where in culture do you experience, other than the church, where do you experience encouragement or support for you to be lived out your sexuality or your relationships, something that is good for your relationships? Another question for you is this, but do you think that you'll look back in five years and regret establishing guardrails around your fidelity? Do you think you're going to be looked back in five years? You know, I, I went to this church and there was a guy there and he spoke, like, I can't even remember his name. He spoke about this idea of putting moral guardrails in place. And I, I put some, you know, I just regret putting those moral guardrails in place. It was just the worst decision. I, I've missed out on so many things. In my, do you really think you're going to feel like that? You're going to breathe a sigh of relief, right? You're going to breathe a sigh of relief. And so the decision for you and the decision for me is this. Are we going to flee or are we going to flirt? Are we going to flee or are we going to flirt? Because fleeing honors God. Fleeing honors you. Fleeing honors the person that you believe is the most important person in the world. Fleeing honors your kids. Fleeing honors your future kids. Fleeing, in fact, honors your grandkids. Fleeing honors others, and fleeing requires guardrails. So I want to encourage you, set some guardrails in your life that ding your conscience when you're still in the safety zone, not once you've gone over that line. When you're still in the safety zone, you will not be applauded now. You will not be applauded as you stand where you are right now, but you will be later by the people that matter most to you and by your Father in heaven. And so I want you to think about it. I want you to talk about it. And ultimately, because it's all about application, I want you to do something about it. Because some of you, you already wish you had. And for most of you, I can tell you that you will be glad that you did. Because at some point in your life, you'll be able to look back and you'll be able to say from the bottom of your heart that I'm forever yours, faithfully. I thought that was pretty cute. But no Journey fans here. No one likes Journey? Okay. Well, hey, if you want to see this message again, and I know you do because some of the men on the front row are like, I'm never coming back to this church ever in my life. Uh, I'd love for you to go to southpointchurch.co.za and you can catch up on this message. You can watch this message again and share this message. In fact, any of these messages you can share with your friends as well. You're able to do that at southpointchurch.co.za. Uh, I'm going to pray for us and we can go grab a cup of coffee together. So let's pray. Father God, thank you for the freedom ultimately to talk about this. Um, and Father, I pray that you would just filter out anything that I've said that you know wasn't intended. I, I don't want to leave anything out there that, that shouldn't be there. And Father God, I, I pray that as we go through life and as we experience life, Father, we're in a culture, we dip into a culture every day that kind of bakes us in. But Father, I pray that we would all be encouraged to be able to set some guardrails that we might be experiencing the freedom that you have brought to this life for us, to your son Jesus. Father God, I pray that you would give us the wisdom to know what to do with what we have heard and ultimately the courage to go out and do, even though it's counter-cultural, cultural, we, we, we want the courage to be able to go out and do what is required of us. Father God, thank you for your son. Thank you for his love for each and every one of us. And it's in his precious name we pray.